welcome to this last lecture in our first uh, series. Uh, the series, as I remind you, will resume on October 21st. That will be a Tuesday. Then there will be a jump due to Diwali. I mean, the, the uh, dates are available in the, the same as what has been circulated. There is no change. So today I want to explore with you the uh, Indian traditions of education. Um, it is a topic which is not very commonly dealt with or very superficially and uh, the reason I personally find it so important is that in my studies of Indian civilization I realized that uh, without such strong educational traditions in fact Indian civilization could not have survived at least not in the form that we know today. Uh, a lot would have been lost. Uh, so, what are these educational traditions is what we are s setting out to explore. And first of all, as always, it's good to go a little back in time and listen to two differing opinions. Uh, these are, both of them are from British officials and uh, they are quite opposite to each other, as you will see. One is by the famous uh, British statesman, orator, writer, uh, Thomas Macaulay, who came to India and who uh, imposed, or let us say strongly recommended, but he was such a powerful figure that it was as good as imposing, uh, the <coughs> adoption of <coughs> uh, English-based education, not only based on the English language, but based on the English content. And he said, well, his uh, long minute on Indian education is famous, uh, but he, he, he explained his um, conviction that a single shelf of a good European library is worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. Indian education consists of false history, false astronomy, false medicine. He was referring to the traditional um, Indian medis medical systems in company with a false religion. Well, of course, he had a vested interest in conversion to Christianity. So this, in his estimate, summed up what passed uh, under the name of education in India. In other words, there was no worthwhile education. Now, <clears throat> pretty much about the same time, we have Thomas Munro, who was a well-known uh, statesman, governor of the Madras presidency, um, and not particularly tender towards Indians uh, when you see his writings as a whole. Uh, he was very much a uh, pillar of the British Raj in India. Uh, nevertheless, his objective to write the following. He says, if a good system of agriculture, you have to follow the, you know, elaborate English. If a good system of agriculture, unrivaled manufacturing skill, a capacity to produce whatever can contribute to convenience or luxury. Schools, that's for us today, schools established in every village for teaching, reading, writing and arithmetic. The general practice of hospitality and charity among each other. And above all, a treatment of the female sex full of confidence, respect and delicacy. If all these are among the signs which denote a civilized people, then the Hindus are not inferior to the nations of Europe. And if civilization is to become an article of trade between the two countries, I am convinced that this country, he is referring to England, will gain by the import cargo, which is a roundabout way uh, to say that, uh, uh, well, uh, England could benefit from Indian civilization <coughs> and would have a thing or two to learn from India. So he is not looking down upon India in the way Macaulay was and um, uh, especially this mention of schools established in every village for teaching, reading, writing and arithmetic is something we will return to. <coughs> I'm sorry, but first we have to start at the beginning and people often ask me, um, you know, in the Indus civilization was there any evidence of schooling? So uh, a, a quick answer is no. Uh, there is no evidence of you know, education and institutions and whatever we understand today by schooling. But there is some evidence, of course there would be 
there would be traditional education as in any society there would be fathers uh, teaching their sons their trade and mothers teaching their daughters whatever they need to learn uh, for a good life but um, but there is still some evidence and this is this one uh, the only evidence as far as I know of uh, education in writing especially uh, the the art of writing and you know that the Harappans had a script so these are small tiny actually terracotta replicas of a bigger object which is I think still today in Hindi called takti and some of you especially in the older generation or your fathers grandfathers uh, uh, you would have seen them using this object which is the Indian equivalent of the, the slate in, uh, in Europe. Uh, it is a piece of wood <coughs> which is sculpted precisely the way the Harappans have it here. And in fact, let me show you the... Um, um, I'm sorry. And uh, this piece of wood has a... At the top of it, it has a kind of a hole which allows it to be um, hanged. You can see the hole here uh, uh, in the middle uh, model of terracotta model of this takti. And when you finish your study, you wipe it off and uh, you, it, you, you write usually with some thing equivalent to chalk, something that will you know, leave a trace on the uh, piece of wood, but you can erase it and you can hang it uh, so that it will not get damaged. And uh, on the right you see, very interestingly, uh, a couple of centuries BC, if I remember well, a uh, terracotta model, so we are 2000 years later now, where you see a child learning on the same takti. I don't know if you can spot, let me find my laser pointer. If you can spot the little hole at the top of it, yes, sorry, and uh, it's remarkable that this object has survived intact from uh, something like 2500 BC here, and here you can you can see the hole, and you can see the the same. Uh, uh, semispheric, semicircular ending and this child is actually pointing to us and he shows us proudly how he is learning and you can see that this is almost a baby you see the anklets here and uh, he is pointing to us he or she in fact I should not be biased uh, to Brahmi letters which uh, uh, he or she has just learned or is practicing so you see how traditions are uh, very ancient sometimes and this actually uh, endured till the 20th century I think now of course it's gone uh, as far as I know uh, but uh, this is maybe one bit of uh, uh, evidence of archaeology of education now we have after that to turn to the texts because that's the uh, that's far more comprehensive and systematic uh, than the archaeology in this case and we first, I first want to remind, uh, to remind you of the broad sequence of uh, Indian literatures. You have first of all the Vedas, the four Vedas. And uh, please remember that uh, Veda, the word Veda comes from Vid, which is knowledge. So Vedas are supposed to be about knowledge. At least they claim that their interest. Uh, it's interesting because there is no sacred book to my knowledge in, in other cultures which actually, you know, uh, sacred books usually refer to a prophet or refer to a, a, some utterance, uh, some revelation. But this, is, this here is knowledge. It is the, the one thing which is regarded sacred. Then after this we have a whole genre of literature called the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas are extensive commentaries on the Vedas with broadly ritualistic focus but also very interesting legends, stories and, and also some philosophical reflections. But for philosophy proper we have to wait for the Upanishads 
uh, that you would be more familiar with. Uh, they are the classical texts of uh, foundations of Indian philosophy and spirituality. And finally, the Vedangas or annexures to the Vedas. What are these Vedangas? Well, they are basically technical texts. And they are technical texts regarding as essential for the learning of the Vedas. So you have phonetics, metrics, and, and there are te existing technical texts in all these disciplines, grammar, etymology, astronomy, and ritual. These are the six classical Vedangas of, uh, l let us call it, the late Vedic period. And uh, any student was supposed to master those six branches which contained uh, some scientific knowledge. For example, I would remind you, I, uh, we briefly saw the Shulba Sutras the other day uh, when I was talking about architecture. We'll return briefly to them in a later talk on in ancient Indian science. So Shulba Sutras are classified here. They are part of ritual because Though they, they deal with geometry, they are actually about the construction of Vedic altars. Similarly, Jyotisha is mainly for building up calendars. Calendars because for the uh, performance of rituals, you have to follow the, 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 the stars, you have to be able to set dates, etc. And this requires some uh, knowledge of astronomy. So this is how astronomy started also in India. So all the knowledge available in, in those days is somewhere in uh, among those six Vedangas. So this is the architecture of knowledge in ancient India and basically knowledge is the focus. In other words, education is not let us say regarded as having uh, any purpose except the transmission of knowledge. This is how, there is no uh, definition of education in any text, but it's very clear when you read through all the texts and traditions that the only uh, uh, concern is to transmit knowledge. In fact, there is a Subhashita which says that a teacher who fails to find in his lifetime one worthy disciple will go to hell. We, whatever he, you know, however virtuous he may have been, he will have to go to hell for some time uh, because it was his sacred duty to find at least one worthy student to transmit. So knowledge must not be allowed to die. That is the idea, basically. Uh, here we find uh, one, uh, there are some depictions in various art forms of edu uh, few educational traditions. Uh, this one is from Barhut in um, uh, Madhya Pradesh, dated 2nd century BC, where you see a master teaching his disciples. And uh, <clears throat> uh, why do I say that uh, he's teaching them to chant the Vedas simply because of the, you know, the fingers beating time, the rhythm of the, uh, of the Vedic mantras. So this is one actually very ancient, uh, one of the most ancient depictions we have of some educational uh, uh, tradition under process. Uh, if we look at, uh, of course, those early times, the institutions would be extremely simple. They are not institutions at all. You simply have basically a guru, a teacher, uh, uh, and the students around him uh, in an ashram or in his home sometimes. And, um, but then there has to be an initiation. There has to be an upanayana to um, uh, you know, imprint in the consciousness of the student that it is a new phase in his life. So usually studentship at that period is regarded as being of 12 years for the mastery of those six Vedangas. Um, they are accepted from the three higher castes. Um, there is some dispute about the last one, but generally I think not. And um, about girls, the, there is a gray area. There are traditions, there are texts which speaks of uh, uh, women scholars, uh, even we, uh, the, the Rig Veda is supposed to have had some hymns composed by women rishis, rishikas, and, um, uh, but then this is not systematic as far as, as we can see. So definitely the advantage was for the boys uh, in the sense that most of these uh, uh, ashrams 
uh, it would be boys learning to, uh, with the uh, guru. But uh, there, are, there are possible exceptions here and there. In any case, there is no bar against it. Teaching methods included discussion, questioning, and um, uh, cross-questioning. In other words, and this we are going to see very interestingly reflected over a long period and this is something which I think is one definite great loss uh, in education system I'm referring to today's school system the fact baiting uh, is art in India and uh, it was really a, a, not only an art it was a technique there are actually books in Sanskrit unfortunately they're not available in English about the art of debating. How do you build an argument? How do you present it? How do you convince your opponent? How do you defeat him in a debate? All these are actually techniques. You know, and today we call it the, you know, the art of presentation or the art of, uh, um, uh, well, uh, art of debating is what we call it today. But it is actually a very uh, ancient and uh, uh, much needed technique in, uh, in ancient India. There are very important historical examples of uh, debates such as uh, Shankaracharya defeating the Buddhist scholars, for example. And it was very much within this tradition of debate, uh, question and answers. Corporal punishment is never in India uh, uh, regarded favorably. It is frowned upon and uh, you know it is considered that a teacher who has to resort to corporal punishment basically has failed somewhere. So it is the ultimate resort. Teachers in this period are not allowed to take any payment. Uh, of course in exchange there will be some service given to them by the uh, disciples. Uh, but they can take a dakshina, that is to say, some offering uh, when the uh, student has completed his studies. In addition, there are uh, to the uh, Vedangas, there would be all kinds of other disciplines actually being uh, taught, uh, which may include various things. Some mentioned in the text are, for example, the knowledge of snakes. You don't forget that these are very, you know, rural. It's a very rural setting, so the, the students have to know about such things. Omens is a science which has uh, 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 concerned ancient Indians for quite some time, even the knowledge of ghosts, etc. So uh, uh, these are some of the uh, fields which were explored. But the important thing here is that, and this covers a very long period of time, uh, in fact all the way into the Buddhist era which we are going to see shortly, there is a distinction in ancient India between inner learning and outer learning. And no student is regarded to be complete under he has mastered both. So inner learning, certain qualities have to be acquired and um, uh, they are as, as important as what today we would call knowledge. Patience, regularity, dedication, these are actual quotations from text. I'm not giving systematic references because it would be too long. I can if required, but uh, these are actual quotations. Self-denial, self-mastery, humility, concentration in the pursuit of knowledge. In other words, if a student is not interested in, in knowledge, well, he cannot be a student at all, basically. Purity of nature, that is to say freedom from defects or major defects. Study of yoga and the yoga sutras. Um, this is something we'll return to, in fact. Outer learning, so the Vedas, of course, that is what we saw. Six Vedangas, that's already quite a bit. Then later on, the philosophical systems of India. There are, as you know, six major systems of philosophy, plus uh, uh, quite a few minor ones and uh, a student was supposed to study all of them. Art of debating, I've already mentioned this. Historical tradition, itihasa. I do not deliberately call it history because in ancient India, in my opinion, it's a mistake to translate itihasa by history. It's actually a ming mingling of history, tradition, uh, mythology, legends, all of it together. <clears throat> and of course it is contained in the two epics and many Puranas. 
Then the Dharma Sutras, that becomes later on in the late Vedic period a very important branch when the society becomes more complex, when urbanism has set in, then people need laws which uh, they may not have required uh, in pre-urban uh, uh, phases of society. And, and uh, this is expounded in the Dharma Sutras. Um, and the various smritis like the Manushmriti and many others. There's a vast literature in this field. And well, students were supposed to know some, some fundamentals of it. Then the military arts also. Um, uh, what is called in fact Dhanur Veda. I will return to that in a moment. Botany and zoology gets added pretty early on uh, for an obvious reason that this is the foundation of India's uh, medical systems. If you do not know the plants, if you do not know uh, the animals, you will not be able to produce uh, medicines. In fact, this leads to Ayurveda. But Ayurveda was a separate branch because it was in itself such a huge field. Uh, it was an exclusive line of education and uh, students who went for this had to take a separate initiation in which they took a, an oath, which um, I will not have time to show it today, unfortunately, but this oath reads very much, uh, it's an Indian version of, uh, uh, you know, the, the European oath which uh, today's uh, medical doctors are still expected to take at the completion of their studies. Uh, there was actually such, a, such an oath, it is in, in Charaka Samhita, maybe in some future talk I'll try to squeeze it in because it's quite interesting. So we have, as I said, some <coughs> art pieces. This is from uh, uh, one of the temples at uh, Khajurao, where you see a, a guru teaching his disciples. And uh, well, you can see that the guru is uh, hale and hearty, um, quite uh, well fed, obviously. But uh, basically, what is expected from him is that you know he must transmit his knowledge and that he is apparently busy doing. Uh, this is another presentation from Konark, so that would be possibly 11th, 12th century um, AD. <clears throat> and you see here on the top, you see a, a guru teaching and he is teaching from, this is interesting, from palm leaf manuscripts. You see what he's holding uh, in his upper hand is a palm leaf manuscript and the uh, disciple here who, who is not very young apparently, is himself holding another palm leaf manuscript. So here, in this case, they are consulting manuscript. This is a later phase, obviously. But very interestingly, the bottom register of this uh, bas relief, uh, we see students here practicing uh, some martial arts, some fighting techniques. I I'll come back to this in a moment. We move on in time first. And uh, we come around 400 BC or so to the Buddhist period. And uh, as soon as Buddhism is founded by Buddha, uh, the Sangha, Buddha first of all founds the Sangha. This is the first thing he does uh, once his uh, teaching becomes accepted. And the Sangha is actually not only a monastic order, an order of uh, monks and nuns, but it is also an educational institution and uh, because this is how the teachings are going to be transmitted. So the Vihara, the monastery, is actually the, the heart of Buddhist education and in time something like 5,000 of them have been counted in India, all over <laughs> India. Uh, probably we are missing quite a few thousand in, in this count because uh, most of them have uh, disappeared without a trace, but they function as centers of learning. Of course, the main focus was Buddhist teaching and the texts, and therefore the Buddhist language, which was Pali, uh, in preference to Sanskrit. Though there are a few uh, uh, Buddhist texts in Sanskrit, but very few. Um, Prakrits also. In fact, Pali is not very far from some of the Prakrits. Here also we note from the Buddhist text that there is a great encouragement given to debates and discussions. So the, the idea throughout is that the student's mind has to be alive. He is not expected to be a passive sponge absorbing 
some knowledge just uh, you know uttered in front of him. He or she, uh, excuse me, I will uh, omit uh, most of the time. Uh, he he is expected uh, to be actively uh, a participant in his education and therefore you know to question to to uh, ask whatever he, he is not clearly understood so from we have a distinction between uh, education five sciences which are grammar grammar is is always essential in india uh, for a mastery a proper understanding of the language arts and crafts, medicine, Buddhism contributed a lot to the development of Indian medicine, uh, including Ayurveda. There's a big Buddhist component in Ayurveda. Uh, logic, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the essential uh, disciplines in ancient India. Inner or spiritual knowledge. So these are uh, some of the top fundamental topics which are listed, but there are many topics like handicrafts, accounting, uh, why accounting? Simply because uh, these Buddhist monasteries become huge, as you will see very shortly, and uh, this requires a lot of account keeping. You have to keep track of what comes in, what goes out. Uh, drawing and painting, so the arts are not ruled out, medicine and surgery. Now, Taxila or Taxashila is um, uh, uh, the, the first uh, uh, center of learning. Actually this um, uh, city existed even before the rise of Buddhism but from the 6th or six, from the 5th or 6th century BC it becomes an important center of learning. Uh, on record we have scholars and students coming from various parts of India entering at the age of 16 which means that this is not for primary education. This is for students who have already uh, acquired the basics and they study the Vedas you see which means that uh, there is no uh, exclusivism though it is predominantly a Buddhist institution Vedas are not thrown out Buddhism science arts and craft medicine law military science even for, for uh, uh, Buddhist monks and technical topics there are a wide number of them or elephant training archery and um, martial arts. Well, there are traditions, there are traditions, we can neither confirm nor reject them, that the taught uh, at uh, Takshila and that Chandragupta Maurya and Charaka were among his students. So in any case, whatever the tradition, this was a very important center. These are some photos of the ruins uh, that can be seen today, not much unfortunately, but we can see here some of the cells uh, which would have been occupied by the monks in one of the monasteries there. Nalanda is a better known uh, uh, case uh, because it is closer to us and because uh, the, the ruins are so, more, so much more monumental, extremely impressive in fact, um, the conventional days are 5th to 12th century CE, but uh, recent excavations tend to show earlier dates, so we have to wait until they are confirmed, but these days could be pushed by a couple of centuries possibly. Now, what's the uh, big difference here is that we have testimonies uh, still existing about Nananda, especially uh, uh, testimonies from the Chinese people. century visited it and according to their uh, uh, memories, their memoirs rather, Nananda had eight separate halls, 300 apartments, meditation halls, classrooms, it was surrounded by parks and lakes which is very easy to believe uh, even when you visit it today. Uh, it looks quite, uh, quite like that. Um, education was free, it was uh, financed by partly by a king, partly by revenue from land and various communities that were contributing to it. Uh, but the students were not expected to pay anything. But of course they would have to give some service in return. So 8,500 students according to Sun 1,500 teachers so you can work out the ratio. Up 100 lectures every day. So you can see the amount of management that this 
Well, it is not a small thing. It is quite comparable uh, to, you know, a, a regular uh, institution of today. And uh, Swan Song notes that the students attend these discourses without any fail, even for a minute. And um, to reach in time, dial apparently the sundial and uh, they would time at the lectures. Uh, what's very interesting also is that there was a general body of students. Uh, not only students were not passive during the teaching, but even for the organization, the running of the whole institution, they had their voice and they could, they could you know, uh, make representations. <coughs> Now, Nalanda was famous, of course, for its library. And um, according to one of the Chinese pilgrims, uh, it had as many as nine stories containing lakhs of manuscripts. This would have been one of the very major repositories in ancient India. And of course, we lost enormously uh, when uh, the university was destroyed uh, uh, by Bhaktiya Khilji, as we discussed already yesterday, in 1193. But interestingly, there is testimony from a Tibetan monk <coughs> by name Dharma Swamin who visits the site in uh, 1235, that is to say uh, about 40 years after the destruction. And there was quite a strong connection between Nalanda and Tibet for some reason. In fact, when the site was destroyed, uh, some of the monks uh, were able to escape with at least a few manuscripts all the way to Tibet. And uh, these manuscripts were translated into Tibetan. And there is in fact an institution in Varanasi today which tries to recreate the original Sanskrit texts out of the Tibetan translations because the original Sanskrit has vanished from India. So uh, there was this strong connection. And this Tibetan monk visits Nalanda. He finds it half ruined. Uh, but there is still a teacher, 90 year old teacher, names as Rahula Sri Bhadra, and he is instructing a class of about 70 students. So you see how persistent, you know, this uh, uh, desire to teach is that, you know, whatever the circumstances, teaching must go on. And this is probably the last classroom at Nalanda 40 years after the, the, the attack on the site. <clears throat> These are some photos I took when I took a group of students uh, to the site. Uh, I was extremely impressed. I had read about it, but I could never imagine the vastness of uh, this is only one of the monasteries. You can see the students standing there. These are all cells for the monks to occupy, monks or students. And, uh, but then it is also a huge organization in terms of uh, mundane things like cooking. You have to cook every day for 10,000 people, so there are huge stores for the grain. All this you know, requires uh, a very complex and um, foolproof management. And it was done for centuries together. There were other uh, such universities. Uh, I may not go over all the details. We can mention briefly Vikramashila, also in Bihar, more or less the same period. Uh, six colleges with 108 teachers and also a strong connection with Tibet. It suffered the same fate as Nalanda. Uh, in Bang what is today Bangladesh, it's quite interesting that uh, there was this uh, Somapur Mahavihara, which was also uh, an important uh, uh, center of learning. Odantapuri in Bihar, possibly almost as large as Nalanda, and others in Gujarat, in Bengal, in Orissa, and so on. So it was uh, a very important network of uh, institutions of higher learning. South India also had uh, such institutions, but they functioned somewhat differently. Uh, many of them were attached either to uh, temples uh, or else to monasteries of various kinds and um, they were of more modest size. Uh, the various dynasties there, for example the Cholas, uh, boasted of um, uh, supporting, sponsoring such uh, institutions. So they were, they were 
uh, endowed by either the king or the temple charities. And uh, in addition, the teachers, who were usually Brahmins, were given whole villages to where they could settle so that they could you know, concentrate on, on their teaching. Uh, they were usually paid by the, by the state, by the king. Among the subjects which are listed in the south are Vedas, Vedanta, Mimamsa, which is one of the uh, six major systems of uh, philosophy, grammar, etc. So not much difference. Uh, we have some inscriptions giving us additional informations. For example, in South Arcot district under uh, Rajendra the uh, first, that would be <coughs> in the 11th uh, century. Uh, 270 uh, junior students, 70 senior students, and 14 teachers. So you can see that the size is more modest, but the institutions are running well. Now, one uh, uh, before we leave this phase of Indian education, uh, there is a certain philosophy uh, behind Indian education. And it is basically connected to the philosophy of what is a human being. And this is the Vedantic, uh, let us say, composition of view of the composition of a human being. Uh, according to Vedanta, we are not one, but we are many. We are many parts. So we have, of course, a physical body, and that needs to be educated. It has to be educated through martial arts, mastery of weapons, Dhanurveda, uh, self-mastery, self-control, yoga, and such methods. Then we have a kind of emotional being, the being what, what really is the source of our life, prana, maya, purusha. That needs its own education through poetry and arts in particular. This is what the text uh, tells us. We have uh, the intellectual being, manomaya purusha, which is probably the only uh, part of us that modern education is really concerned with. And that has to be educated well through all the methods we have seen, like reasoning, logic, argumentation, debate, development of memory. But there is also a spiritual being uh, which needs some totally different form of teaching, and that will be uh, techniques of yoga for spiritual growth. And this is clearly spelled out in the text. There is, of course, a, a supreme being, but that doesn't require uh, education. It requires uh, uh, our discovering it, that is something different. So this is the philosophy behind, and if we take uh, the, the first martial arts, I just wanted to mention, uh, without taking much time to uh, over it, because this is actually quite a huge uh, and very interesting field in India, and I'm glad, I'm glad that some of India's traditional martial arts are being revived here and there, both in North and in South India. We find that uh, there was a lot of insistence of developing a very solid physical being. And um, uh, it was called Malayudha or Kusti. Kusti is, of course, a more recent term. Malayudha actually is spelled out in great detail in a text called Malapurana, which was uh, written, composed in Gujarat, and uh, the, the, the text is available. And uh, it lists out all the techniques in great detail of, of uh, fighting and defeating an opponent. So, of course, combat could be uh, with bare hands, uh, with sticks, clubs, uh, swords, maces here, as in, in this popular depiction of the last uh, battle between uh, Bhima and uh, Duryodhana. But you can see that the traditions persisted, and uh, <coughs> many of you, I'm sure, would know <coughs> that uh, there are many traditional gymnasiums where uh, you can learn wrestling and uh, maybe this is in fact one reason why uh, Indians are doing so well in, in wrestling at the Olympics and other international arenas uh, because this tradition has been quite persistent in India. Uh, you can see this uh, proud uh, wrestler here uh, who is going to demonstrate wrestling with clubs. So uh, all these techniques and many more, I do not have to, for example, to uh, speak on Kalari Payatu, the martial arts of Kerala, uh, were regarded as an essential part of education. They were not... Uh, then, then there is another uh, source 
which is the city for us. In addition to this, accomplished, cult uh, cultured people, refined people, it was a measure actually of refinement and culture, were supposed to master 64 hours. I'm not even going to read them out. You can just pick one or two at random. And uh, this list is from the Kama Sutra, in fact. But it is something totally endless and quite mind-boggling. And it's difficult to, to believe that someone could have mastered all of these. But anyway, this is what the text tells us. So it, it uh, includes almost every possible human activity. Uh, as far as I can see, <coughs> including, including, of course, uh, again, physical, uh, uh, the, the, you know, techniques of wrestling, fighting, and so on, but also a lot of intellectual exercises. Uh, for example, look at this number 27, solution of riddles, enigmas, covered speeches, that is to say, coded speech, verbal puzzles, what today we would call brain teasers, and enigmatical questions. So um, there's a lot of insistence, you know, on developing all mental faculties. <coughs> Look at this one, for instance, the art of understanding writing in cipher, again, coded writing, which was used extensively in ancient India, and the writing of words in a pe peculiar way. Um, there, I, you know, there, there, is, there are some ways to sometimes corroborate such evidence, uh, for example, I stumbled in the Saraswati Mahal library of Tanjavur on a, a manuscript which was shown to us by the curator. It's a Sanskrit manuscript. And if you read it in the normal way, it's an abridged version of the Mahabharata. But if you read it starting from the last letter and backward, it is the Maramayana. It sounds impossible, but it is true, and it was an art, and it is listed somewhere among those 64 arts. If you read it backward, it is the number 40? 45. 45, the art of speaking by changing the form of words. Some speak by changing the beginning and end of words, others by adding unnecessary letters between every syllable of a word and so on. This is slightly different. It's a way to in a confused way so that others will not understand you. In fact, in France we had one such, it was called Javanese, I think. We had one such way of uh, confused speak, confusing speech. But, um, but this is, these are some of the you know, uh, uh, techniques which did exist. Uh, we can read this one just and then we'll pass on because uh, this is just too vast. Let us read the first one. Mental exercises such as completing stanzas or verses and receiving a part of them or supplying one, two or three lines when the remaining lines are given indiscriminately from different verses so as to make the whole an entire verse with regard to its meaning or arranging the words of a consonant or leaving them or out altogether, etc., etc., etc. So you can see the... the um, um, number of techniques that a cultured person was supposed to master. Not only that, but all kinds of crafts, all kinds of arts, and, um, <coughs> uh, and uh, you know, from even the making of artificial flowers, uh, which is therefore not a new thing in India. So we now jump, and this is the last part of my presentation, on the pre-colonial times, because I am exceptionally leaving ancient India to show you that there is a continuity all the way to the uh, time when the British come and finally um, impose their system of education. And um, we have very important testimonies, uh, beginning the earliest one from an Italian, I think he was Italian, if I'm not mistaken, traveler to India, 1623, and he writes, the Indians are particularly anxious and attentive to instruct their children to read and to write. Education with them is an early and important business in every family. Many of the women are taught to read and write. This is interesting, we'll come back to this. The Brahmins are generally the schoolmasters, but any of the castes may and often do practice teaching. The children are instructed without violence, and by a process peculiarly simple. The pupils are the monitors of each other. That is to say, the, the, the students actually teach each other. It's not just 
the, the teacher. And the characters are traced with a rod or the finger on the sand. Reading and writing are acquired at the same time and by the same process. So this is a very important and quite faithful testimony as far as we can see. We jump to the next century and there is a Jesuit father from Austria who writes, a schoolmaster in Malabar, that's of course a part of Kerala, receives every two months from each of his pupils for the instruction given them two fanan or panam. Now two panam, I do not really know the exact equivalent, but it would be uh, in any case much less than one rupee. Uh, some do not pay in money, but give him a certain quantity of rice so that his expenses become very easy to the parents. There are some teachers who instruct children without any fee and are paid by the overseers of the temple or by the chief of the caste. So you see how, and this is actually quite the same scenario as, as we saw in ancient India, that uh, um, education was basically regarded as something that should be free for, from the point of view of the student. And it was financed in various ways. When the pupils have made tolerant progress in writing, they are admitted into certain schools called Yutupipalli, where they begin to write on palm leaves, so this is the more advanced uh, education, which when several of them are stitched to stitch together and fastened between two boards from a grantha, that is an Indian book, a manuscript. So this is also faithful accounts. Then we move to British reports, and those British reports are very interesting because uh, they predate uh, Macaulay's uh, uh, statement, indictment, I should say, uh, by several decades. And one, William Adam, in particular, wrote three major reports which are available, uh, where he gave uh, not only observations like what we're going to read, but statistics. Statistics on what was the actual condition of education in the regions which where the British were penetrating. So therefore, first of all, the Bengal presidency, uh, the Madras presidency, and a little bit on the west also. And uh, these reports <coughs> were soon forgotten by the British themselves. Uh, they were rediscovered uh, by a Gandhian scholar uh, known as Dharampal, who wrote uh, important book called The Beautiful Tree, which is available freely on, on the internet, uh, where you can find uh, summaries of these reports and a lot of statistics on the condition of education uh, by the time the British reached India. <coughs> so, Adam notes that the desire to give education to their male children must be deeply seated in the minds of parents, even of the humblest classes. Uh, he notes, and this is of course quite staggering, one to one and a half lakh village schools in Bengal and Bihar up to 1830. So that's, um, uh, that's one village school for every 63 children in average. Uh, so therefore a very extensive uh, uh, system but totally decentralized. It's not as if those schools you know, have an apex body, there is no such thing. Uh, they are quite independent, but this is obviously in line with the older traditions. Then, these are the basic learning. Today we would call them, we would call them uh, primary or secondary schools, but after this there are institutions of higher learning, and he counts a hundred of them in each district of Bangor. Madras Collectorate had uh, 322 native schools and colleges uh, in 1822. Uh, so that's all, also quite uh, quite a bit. That's only for Madras Collectorate. Uh, if I take uh, Coimbatore, uh, which is uh, towards the Western Ghats, 763 schools with a total of over 8,000 students. So of course we can see that the schools have few students on average. They are small, but they exist. And <coughs> 173 institutions of higher learning, uh, also with few students each. Uh, but nevertheless, they are available for those who want. The statistics given by William Adam are the following. <coughs> students are there from all four castes. And this is important because it gives the lie to a frequent uh, uh, colonial statement that whatever education existed in, in India was exclusively 
for the Brahmins, you know, not for the other castes, or maybe the Kshatriyas, but no others. And very interestingly, <coughs> what we find in those village schools is just the opposite. <coughs> Brahmins 12%, Vaishyas 3.5%. Why so little? Because the Vaishyas, the traders, so, uh, wanted you know their, their children to be quickly trained in the family business. This is my interpretation. So they would they would give more like home training or, or even maybe directly in the business uh, uh, the child and would not send him uh, or her possibly to the school. Shudras eight percent and others six point five percent. So therefore, uh, it is not as if the uh, lowest caste were debarred from uh, education, at least not at the village level. <coughs> in uh, uh, Coimbatore and Madurai region, one percent uh, of um, uh, Shudra and low caste girls, only one percent. But in other regions, like in Manabar in, in Kerala, fifteen percent were girls. So the girls, you see, there was no bar against girls attending schools. In fact, it is uh, the upper caste girls who were most uh, absent from such schools because they were uh, uh, educated at home. And uh, this is one rare depiction we have of uh, such a school in the 19th century. This is actually for uh, Muslim students, obviously, uh, in Agra, 1871. Uh, but uh, probably the Hindu schools would have been uh, something comparable uh, uh, to this kind of setting. And uh, I want to read out the testimony <coughs> of a member of the Council of the Bombay Presidency in 1820. So this is 15 years before Macaulay's verdict, where he writes, and it's very interesting because it's quite detailed, he says, I need hardly mention what every member of the board knows as well as I do, that there is hardly a village, great or small, throughout our territories in which there is not at least one school and it larger, in larger villages more, many in every town and in large cities in every division, where young natives are taught reading, writing and arithmetic upon a system so economical from a handful or two of grain to perhaps a rupee per month to the schoolmaster, according to the ability of the parents. So in any way, there was no fixed fee. And at the same time, so simple and effectual that there is hardly a cultivator or petty dealer who is not competent to keep his own accounts with a degree of accuracy, in my opinion, beyond what we meet with among the lower orders in our own country, that is England. So you see he compares uh, Indian uh, village uh, education quite favorably to that of England. While the most splendid dealers and bankers keep their books with a degree of ease, conciseness and clearness, I rather think um, fully equal to those of any British merchant. So this is um, a faithful account and we have, you know, those of you who have um, studied Indian society of even the 20th century to any degree would recognize certain things. I would like to mention, for instance, uh, the, the story told by Professor Ashok Junjunwala of IIT Madras. He has written a little book on Indian mathematics where he prefaces uh, it with this story where, uh, you know, he is he, a, a very eminent professor. I forget quite in which discipline some of you. Electrical, all right. And um, one day he wanted to build bookshelves in his home because he had a lot of books to stack. So he called a carpenter. Uh, this must have happened some in the 1970s, 80s, maybe 80s. And um, I forget. Anyway, and he asked him to, you know, he says, I want this kind of shelves and this length and this height and so on. And he gives all the dimensions. Now the carpenter, of course, has to calculate the amount of wood in cubic feet, because you know that this is how wood is paid. It's the, the rate is per, so much per cubic foot. So the carpenter starts cal calculating in his own way. He's a semi-illiterate man. He's just a traditional carpenter. Now, uh, Professor Junjunwala, it's not that he distrusts the carpenter, but he says, okay, let me cross-check. And he starts calculating also in his own way. And he finds that within five minutes, the carpenter has completed all the but he still has to spend seven, eight minutes before he comes to the end of it. 
And he finds that they both have the same result in the end. Now he does not understand how is this man, who is not educated, able to calculate so fast. And the, actually he asks him, and he explains, he's written a whole article, maybe it's available on the net. Anyway, I have this article for those who want. And he, I said, how did, how did you manage? And the carpenter explains there are certain techniques of shortcuts in calculations. You know, so for example, uh, if you have a plank which is 12 inches, you don't take it as 12, you take it as 1. You know, it's going to simplify, it's 1 foot. Somewhere later on. So you just keep it in the corner of your mind. And through many such shortcuts, some fast calculation techniques which have been traditional also in India, He's able to reach this with hardly a few marks. Actually, most of the calculation is done. So this is quite in conformity with such testimonies. A quick look at some of the topics listed in those British reports as being taught in village schools. But I suspect that not all of them would be taught in all schools. I think this is just a wide list which you can uh, just uh, see. Uh, I think it would depend on the particular need. But then, strangely, there is still one case at least of an ancient form of Indian university surviving in Bengal, in what is today in Abadweep, uh, which is spelt uh, New Di uh, something uh, by the British, and where they find three colleges, <coughs> each endowed with lands for maintaining masters in every science. So land endowment are the, the, is the source of wealth for the university. It's a fairly interior area in Bengal. And uh, they write, the British who write this, mention that whenever the revenue of these lands proved too scanty for the support of the pundits and their scholars, the Raja's treasury supplies the deficiency. This is quite in conformity with the ancient system. We are in 1791. There are at present 1,100 students and 150 masters. Their numbers, it is true, fall short of those in former days. Earlier, there were no less than 4,000 students and masters in proportion. The students that come from distant parts are generally of a maturity in years and proficiency in learning. So they are not, you know, primary students. This is for advanced students. By the Pandit's system of education, all valuable work, works are committed to memory. And this is something which has been a constant practice uh, in India, committing, uh, you know, a lot of things, texts, uh, uh, techniques, developments uh, to the memory, not trusting the written medium too much. Their method of teaching is this. Two of the masters commence a dialogue or disputation on the particular topic they mean to explain. When a student hears anything advanced or expressed that he does not perfectly understand, he has the privilege of interrogating the master about it. See, once again, this is what we've seen from the beginning, the student has to be a, a living part of the process. He has to participate, he has to be mentally alert, and he has total freedom to put questions at any step. They give the young men every encouragement to communicate their doubts by their temper and patience in solving them. It is a professed and established maxim of uh, Nabadweep that a pundit who lost his temper in explaining any point to a student, let him be ever so dull and void of memory, the student, absolutely forfeits his reputation and is disgraced. And so you see the demand made not only on the student but also on the teacher, right? Uh, this is quite conformity. Uh, it is not only the student who is expected to display self-control, self-mastery, but the professor just as well, the, the teacher. So <clears throat> my conclusions from this very rapid survey of the field, which uh, is something which we don't talk sufficiently about, uh, in my view, in India, because I think we would have basically some lessons still to draw. I'm not saying that we can replicate the ancient system, that of course is not possible, but certain lessons about the, the, the method of learning, the, the whole spirit of what education is about, uh, is uh, something at least we can have some food for thought. Uh, the first is that India certainly achieved high efficiency 
in its educational systems. We have seen that. And uh, the beauty is that this was a completely decentralized network. There was never a, an empire commanding over the entire educational system of India. It never happened. So this decentralization within a certain broad common tradition is what made it so successful. And it could, you know, survive the vagaries of history and the, 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 the various up and ups and downs of uh, economy. And it was highly economical, as the British did note. Education aimed at the integral development of the student, both the inner being and the outer being. Uh, this is something, of course, that we lost, even though today we timidly start speaking of personality development, uh, you know, and uh, uh, such terms, uh, we are still very far from what the ancients looked at a, a necessary blossoming of the inner being. Uh, but uh, it is even uh, when there were no such mainstream educational institutions, actually there were parallel systems operating. And one of them I have already mentioned in an earlier talk on India's sacred geography. It is, for example, the Harikatha institution that was a proper institution, uh, but it actually was education. Uh, this is how uh, you know, the, the, the vast population of India and beyond learned about a lot of texts, especially the two epics. And so it was a form of education. And then, of course, popular arts, folk theater, drama, dance, all the performing arts, basically, were also a form of education. So uh, it, it, this is necessary to supplement the whole picture. So one uh, interesting question to conclude is, and Macaulay, as I said initially, was the one who vigorously promoted the case for uh, British, English-based British education. And he did it out of sincerity. He was sincerely convinced that there was nothing worth basically teaching uh, in the Indian tradition. So let us just sweep all that away. But actually there was a school of European scholars who opposed him. And they were known as the Orientalists. They were what we would call today Indologists, and the leader among them was James Princip, whom I've mentioned already several times, uh, who was, uh, who's acquired fame for deciphering Brahmi. The Brahmi script was first deciphered by James Princip in the uh, 1820s and 30s. And they opposed Macaulay. They said it is wrong to impose English as a medium of instruction on Indians. Let them have Sanskrit for the Hindus and Arabic for the Muslims. And let us not interfere with their system. We have no reason to. We can offer certain disciplines, but then let them be taught in their own languages. But as I said, Macaulay was a very powerful figure, uh, very imposing, and uh, basically this voice was brushed aside. So as a matter of speculation, uh, we can just wonder what would have happened if the British Raj had adopted the policy of teaching Indians in their languages and not in English. Well, it is just offered as a matter of speculation. So finally, we speak today, I think it was our previous Prime Minister who was very fond of speaking of a, a knowledge-based society. Uh, uh, I don't know whether our society today is knowledge-based or is it information-based. There's quite a bit of debate about this, but certainly uh, Indian civilization was, if not knowledge-based, at least uh, knowledge-obsessed. It was obsessed with uh, knowledge, b creating knowledge, adding to it all the time. Not that knowledge is fixed once and for all, and transmitting transmitting it so that it would uh, remain alive. So this is uh, the uh, conclusion. I do think that um, uh, there are some lessons we can draw from this uh, uh, understanding, better understanding of India's ecological traditions, excuse me, educational traditions, uh, especially in terms of pedagogy. That is to say the relationship between the the teacher and the student is, I think, something that uh, needs to be considerably improved upon in today's educational system. Well, this is another debate altogether. Thank you.